Welcome to Make Ready TV, where the world's most experienced firearms professionals train you one-on-one. -on -one. And I'm Matt Jaquies. And I'm Kaylee Jeans. In our tactical training segment, we're going to Pat Rogers, who's going to teach us how to make ready on the range. And then in our self-defense segment, we're going to cover some situational awareness. And I'll cover that. Nice. For our long gun shooting segment, we're going to Jim Gilliland, who's going to show us some long gun fundamentals. Then we're going to have some pro tips from two guys that are staples in this industry. Legends, if you will. Super Dave Arrington and Louis Auerbuck. It's going to be a good time. Nice. For now, let's go to Pat Rogers from EAG Tactical. Our command to make ready is make ready. We're going to protect our eyes, protect our ears, fully load our pistol and load our carbine. The reason we load our pistol first is that the pistol is last resort. It's out of sight, out of mind, and I want to make sure that the only gun I may have working, the pistol, is completely loaded and ready to go. This is the way it'll work. My eyes are already on. I'll protect my ears. I'll take my pistol out, take a magazine from the least accessible magazine pouch. I like to keep the pistol up where I can see it, but not dead in front of my face. I'll feel for the top round with my index finger, then I'll put it into the magwell, flat to flat, push it through. Rotate the pistol, cycle the slide. Then I'm going to pull the slide back so I can expose the round in the chamber. I will feel for that round. If I can feel it there, I'll let the slide go forward. Now I have one round less in the magazine, so I am going to execute a tactical reload with the pistol. I'm going to take a magazine out of the pouch, bring it underneath the gun, hit the mag release, extract the old, put the new one in, put the partially expended magazine inside my dump pouch, and then I'll holster the pistol. To load the carbine, I like to keep my head up when I'm doing this. I like the carbine either to be in my shoulder or if it's getting heavy for you, tucked underneath your armpit. I'm going to rotate the carbine slightly outboard so I am exposing a pathway between my magazine pouch and my magazine well. I'll take a magazine out and I'm going to feel for the top round. It's either going to be on the right side or the left side because it's a staggered feed magazine. In this case, it's on the right side. I'm going to take the magazine and put it in the magazine well. While I can thread the needle, it's not always efficient. So my preference is to put flat to flat, rotate it in, and then I'm going to push the magazine in and try to pull it out. Push, pull. Once I'm satisfied the magazine is seated, I'm going to let the bolt go forward. If the bolt is locked to the rear, I can use my hand to hit the bolt latch. Otherwise, I'm going to take my support side hand, cycle the action. I'm going to remove the magazine and feel for the top round. It's on the left side now. That means the round is chambered. I'll put it back in with the push-pull. Then I'm going to roll the gun, feel for the bolt close, close the dust cover, and engage the mechanical safety on. If I want to unload the gun, I'm going to remove the source of ammunition first and stow it. If your SOP is to capture the round, I'll roll the gun on the right side, lock the bolt to the rear, roll the gun, visually and digitally inspect the chamber, and if the gun remains in my possession, it's an unloaded gun. Once more, to load the carbine, tuck it under your arm, rotate the gun outboard, feel for the top round, it's on the right side. Put it in the magazine, well, with the push-pull. If the bolt is locked to the rear, hit the bolt release, let the bolt go forward, move the magazine, feel for the top round. If it's moved and it has this time, it's on the left side. I'm going to put it back in with the push-pull, roll the gun, feel for the bolt, close the dust cover, put the mechanical safety on. Guys, we need to understand that the bolt catch, we can hit it with our thumb, we can hit it with our hand. It's very contentious. Some people want to get in fist fights about this. We understand that using your thumb is a fine motor skill, using your hand is a gross motor skill. Having said that, it probably isn't worth the effort to argue about it. Fine motor skills are something we can, we can work around. If we start thinking about people who fly fast movers, F-15s, F-16s, F-18s, something that's going really quick up there, they're under a lot of pressure and they have to make very minute corrections in their control inputs in order to move that plane around the sky. Fine motor skills. And yet we don't have a whole series of F-16 and F-15 and F-18 lawn dots out here because 
the people can train out of it. If we look at rotary wing, helicopter pilots out there with pitch and collective and the rotor pedals, they're manipulating them all at the same time. They're looking outside the windscreen for other traffic. They're talking on the radio, maybe even firing guns. And they can certainly train out of it. We can train out of it too. Make Ready TV is brought to you by FNH USA, Smith & Wesson, TNVC, and Pro Ears. You know, Pat used to teach at Gunsight when my father did. I love that guy. I think I remember him being a little taller, though. Anyway, now let's go to Matt to review some situational awareness. Take it away, Matt. Let's take a couple of minutes and talk about situational awareness. Little things that you can do as you travel about the day that could possibly keep you from having to use deadly force in an encounter that you could have possibly avoided right from the get-go. A couple of things to think about. As you're driving along and you're going to drive into the bank, maybe make a deposit, or you're going to drive through the the, uh, the drive through portion of a convenience store or, or getting a cup of coffee, things like that. Think about when you pull in, how close do you park to that person in front of you? How much space do you leave in between your vehicle and the person in front of you? When given the choice, if I leave a half a car length or a car length in between the front of my vehicle and the rear of the vehicle in front of me, that allows me a, a little bit of a comfort barrier. One, if somebody approaches from my driver's side and or I see them coming in and I perceive a threat, maybe deadly force is not authorized, maybe it looks like it could get to that point, I would much rather see myself or, or my wife or, or anybody else that's out there perhaps drive through the shrubs that are next to the bank and up over the curb and, and get out of there and, and just completely remove yourself from the situation because you perceive the threat. That is an easy justification to the, the law enforcement officer when he shows up and says, hey, we got a report that you damaged some shrubs at the bank or at Starbucks or whatever. That's an easy fix you can explain to what you saw and the reasons why you did it. It's easier to justify damaging some bushes than getting into a gunfight with somebody that, that could possibly be a deadly threat or is a deadly threat, and you've just removed yourself from the situation. In all of that, think about in a city street, when you pull up to a red light, do you leave yourself a little bit of, of room so you can uh, maneuver right or left should something happen? Are you constantly in the middle lane so now you have nowhere to go? You've essentially boxed yourself into a problem with no way out. So now you have no other options but possibly to withdraw your handgun, maybe use deadly force or try and get your way out of it. Maybe you have to push a vehicle or ram into somebody else to get out of the way. Leave yourself an option, a viable option, to remove yourself from the situation altogether. One of the things that a lot of guys in the industry still continue to talk about is Colonel Jeff Cooper came up with the color codes. Now the color codes were something that I used specifically when I was a field training officer in law enforcement not necessarily breaking them down by color in white, yellow, orange, and red, but when I would train a new guy and we'd be driving along and, and I constantly would tell him, hey, you need to be aware of what's going on in that situation where perhaps something happens directly in front of you, but you don't know where you are. When I would train those new law enforcement officers, I could get them to, at any point in time, I could just say, stop the car, where are we? Uh, somebody just shot into the cruiser and I got hit and now I'm I'm incapable of getting on the radio and letting them know where we are. Trying to get them in the mindset of know what's going on, be aware of where you are at all, all points in time. If somebody rams the cruiser, you know, f just from a, a minor vehicle accident, there was no malice intended, but whenever something happens, you need to think outside of the box. How am I going to help myself get out of here? So with that, talking about the color codes, condition white is Basically, you have really no preparation. You have no way of planning to get out of a situation. The only thing that would probably save you if somebody attacks you in condition white is if they are completely inept, not trained, not prepared anything else, and probably a lot of luck that you would actually be able to survive and get out of that encounter without any issues. Condition yellow is where you're, you're starting to become a little more alert. You're trying to remain aware of things that's going on around you. Maybe you leave a little extra distance when you're at the drive through Maybe you try and get yourself in one of the outside lanes as you're approaching a traffic light to leave yourself the avenue. You don't necessarily have to be armed in level yellow, but you're, you're raising that awareness a little bit. And in condition yellow, you should always be in condition yellow if you're in unfamiliar surroundings. You leave and you're, you're out of your normal environment. You're, you're not in the, uh, the small area around your house. You're not in your hometown where you know where the streets are and you, 
you recognize familiar people or you're in your workplace, things like that, you travel out of town for, for business or for pleasure, you should constantly keep your head on a swivel, picking up what's going on around you. Look for things that are out of place. Condition orange. Condition orange is you have recognized a perceived threat. There's something going on that has caught your attention. Maybe it's the, uh, the scene that plays out in the convenience store in front of you of, of some sort of assault that's going on. Maybe you see a, a brandishing of a firearm. You perceive what is going on that, that's possibly a robbery or a carjacking, something like that, that that's going on. So now you perceive negative things that are going on and maybe you need to think about getting into to either get yourself out of or get into that situation and help resolve it. Condition red, which is the, the highest that you can get, according to Colonel Jeff Cooper, is you're actually in the fight. He's brought the fight to you or you have had to react to something that has happened to you. So if you're not prepared for that, if you're not in one of those, and it, it is possible to go from white to red, like I said, and the only thing that will probably save you is the inept ability of the attacker. But you should try and be in condition yellow when you're out looking around things that go on. I would like to think that more times than not in a 10 hour shift as a law enforcement officer, I was more in orange than I was in yellow. I was automatically a target. If you are in the business or as a law enforcement officer or in the military or in the business where people are looking at you and perhaps they don't like your profession, I would encourage you to try and think about what you need to do. Living in condition orange, you can do that. You can turn orange on and live at that plateau for a while. It becomes tiring, but you don't necessarily want to stay in white. You're unprepared. So all of that being said, be aware of what's going on. Do not keep your head down and, and not pay attention to what's going on with you. There have been a couple of times where in the, my home state, you're allowed to carry open carry. And I've walked into a convenience store. I've walked into a, a grocery store with an open carry handgun on in a plain white t-shirt and the handgun is exposed. Out of 30 or 40 people in that business, most of them, an extreme high percentage, had no idea, didn't pay any attention that there was a gun even in the building. So think about that. Look around and find out what's going on around you. It will serve you well and possibly keep yourself safe and your family safe. Thanks, Matt. That is great information. And you know, just keep in mind, it's always a good thing to remember not to put yourself in harm's way. Crowded building, walking down the street at night, really anything. Up next, we have Jim Gilliland from Shadow 6 to give us some fundamentals on the long gun. Before we do our pre-fire checks and before we start zeroing, I want to go over some rifle fundamentals. There's four basic rifle fundamentals. There's steady position, breathing, side alignment, and trigger control. Of these four, trigger control by all means is the absolute most important. You can be as in steady position as you want with a perfect sight picture and never breathe. And if you jerk that trigger, then you're gonna throw your shot. Shooters have a tendency to bobble their sights, no matter how steady they are. If you can pull your trigger in a clean, stable manner and break it clean, then 90% of your shots are going to go exactly where you're trying to aim anyway. Most of the time, you're right in the X ring anyway. So when we build our fundamentals, we're gonna get behind our gun. Before we ever engage targets, ensure that we're in a good position. Straight with the gun, comes through, exit somewhere on the inside of my thigh right here. All the recoil will be taken by my body. I'm gonna get my breathing under control, calm down. My steady position comes from the use of the bipods and the sand sock here in the back. And that's what I'm gonna use for this elevation change. Rock into my gun. Now my breathing is under control and I'm in a steady position. My side alignment for using this optic like this is you're gonna ensure that you've got a proper eye relief when you set your rifle up. You have a solid black circle on the inside of your scope. It should be completely symmetrical all the way around. Ensure that when you're on your target, your parallax is completely set. That's good. Now, we're gonna talk about trigger control. So however you put your hand on your pistol grip has a lot to do with what your actual trigger finger is gonna do. For me, I, I like the ergo grip on the ARs. It puts me to where when I pull my trigger, I have the, the end portion 
just before the digit on my trigger. Now, if you've got really big hands, you can choke all the way up in and put that middle digit on there. There's nothing wrong with that. The process is, when you're pulling the trigger, that you pull the trigger and break it clean without moving your sights. Perfect marksmanship is that easy. Making the gun go bang without moving your sight off the target. It's everything else that you do that makes it hard. So, get a good grip on your rifle. You're in here, steady position. Your sights are aligned. Parallax is set. You're gonna come off safe. Get your breathing under control. And when you pull through, you should be able to pull your trigger without moving your sights off target. Your follow through is just as important as your trigger pull. As you notice, I still have my finger back on the trigger and I'm gonna let it up. Naturally, the gun would have cycled, so you would have heard a click when the trigger uh, reset. All you're trying to do is to make the trigger go from forward to back in a straight line, as smooth as possible, and breaking the sear without actually moving your sight. You do this by combining all four fundamentals. We go hot, eyes and ears. Breathe under control. Steady position. I'm not moving or shaking. Side is lined perfectly on the target. Conscious thought is on my crosshair on the target. Unconscious thought is to start my trigger pull and just let the rifle recoil. I'm gonna reset. Without moving anything, I'm still in a steady position. Sights are still aligned. Breathing's under control. Pull back through my shot again. And if you noticed, there's very little movement in the rifle. Good solid foundation when the recoil is coming straight through my body, so it's out and back down on target. The fundamentals will absolutely build what you need. This video is about building basics, and the four fundamentals is just about as basic marksmanship as you can get. Master them, and you'll be the greatest shot. Jim and I have been friends for years. And that guy knows a lot about a scoped rifle. And he's got a resume that can back it up. Definitely. And knowing the fundamentals can keep you with a clear mind and in control. Like firearms yoga. No yoga for me. Okay. Well, then on to our pro tips. The Make Ready TV Pro Tips are presented by Battle Comp Enterprises. The first thing that comes to mind in respect to a defensive mindset is I don't subscribe to a defensive mindset. Being situationally aware, reading your surroundings, making sound judgment calls on what has taken place in your time and space and act on the circumstances, to me is in a sense conditioning people to sit around, wait for something to happen to them before they take action about it. Target selection is a biggie. You can't replicate street realistic targets simply by moving a shooter closer or further from the target. So starting in sequence, this is a very good target for competition shooters, EPSIC, or for a neophyte who's starting off shooting to get the basics of mechanics because all it is when it comes down to it, when it's all boiled down, is sights, trigger control, follow through on this. It's got nothing to do with the street in essence. Moving on one stage up from that is taking the same target, putting curvature to it, maybe angling it, 
or turning the entire stand sideways to simulate somebody higher or lower than you are on a flight of stairs, which chains the point of impact, shrinks down the target laterally, anything that you wish to do to get away from the original same old target over and over and over. And then onto this, maybe some clothing, which is essentially the same as this target, but some clothing, some human definition on it, maybe a bit of movement, but that's for the viewer to decide. So this would be a lot better than the initial one. The second one would be better than the first one. The third one would be better than the second, but that's all relative to what you require on what you're trying to get out of your range session. For the street, you have to have something like this or anything else. You could take a party balloon, hang it from a piece of string in a gentle breeze, as long as it's moving. Different size balloons, anything along those concepts. Make Ready TV is brought to you by Brownells, The SIG Academy, Rand Innovations, and Core Bond. So, why do they call Dave Harrington Super Dave? Dude, you've never heard the story about the voodoo chief and the goat and Chad. No. Gotta check it out. It's on the website. I'll have to check it out. In the meantime, for more one on one tips from our instructors, either via streaming video or DVD, go online to makereadytv.com. It's a great show. Until next week, train smart, train often, victory first. The Make Ready DVDs are available from Brownells.com. <laughs> oh, I know, they told me you were going to go high. I was like, let me just get ready. <laughs> so the next thing I'm going to do... Now I know what it's like to spoon with Pat Rogers. <laughs> I'm <laughs> not.